if you're after pollination and that's it, that's totally cool. But we're the type of beekeeper that is involved and we want to not have bees, we want to keep bees and, and, and work with them in, uh, in improving our garden and improving our lives. Mm -hmm. So how often should you go into a beehive? We recommend every seven to 10 days because most of the bees are female. It's not the queen who can live for five to seven years. It's not the drones that live for one season. Um, it is mainly worker bees and they conveniently have a period of egg to emergence out of their cell of 21 days. Mm -hmm. So 21 days, three weeks. So every week you could visit the hive and get a picture of how this brood is growing or reducing or problematic. So um, that period is, is, is pretty good. So if you go into your hive uh, once a week and get into a routine, that is optimal. However, people are busy. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the weather is adverse. Mm -hmm. Sometimes um, you just don't feel like going into the bees. And um, so I'm gentle with the seven to 10 day um, recommendation. Mm -hmm. It should be no less than, you know, three days. If you're going in, you know, twice a week, every day, it's, it's too much. I don't recommend letting it go for more than two weeks. Um, because, especially in, in the spring and summer, because you know how I talked about the 21 days for the worker bees, the queen only takes egg to emergence 16 days. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you don't go in, you know, if, if you don't go in for like a three week period, you could miss a whole new queen being uh, laid and birthed and mated. Mm -hmm. So periodic visits to your hive is totally recommended. A lot of people ask about how off, uh, how much time overall the beehive takes. Um, one hour a week for most of the year. So during swarm season, which I'll talk about shortly, uh, during honey harvest season, uh, during you know certain periods of curiosity, you might be more. It might take more than an hour. You might go in to the hive more often. Uh, you might you might show off your hive. The way I used to, and hey, let's let's go in for you know, and and hang around the bees, uh, and and leave it open for like hours at a time. I don't totally recommend that, but about an hour a week is what you should think about in terms of time commitment. Over the course of uh, the winter, there's like no commitment. So from late October, maybe early November, through to February, we're talking about minutes per day or like zero time. That, that the hive takes. Mm -hmm. But over the course of the, the whole year, an hour uh, per week. Um, and we're going to utilize that hour today by looking at four different hives. So let me move a little bit to hive inspection and why you would want to do that. So during a hive inspection, the goal is to assess the overall health of the hive. And in doing that, we're going to look for the queen or evidence that she's laying. At this time of year, because it's fall, uh, we expect her to be laying, a, well, we first expect her to be existing, uh, but if she's laying, she's laying less than she would in the spring or, or summer, when the beehive is really trying to increase its numbers because there's so much food. They want to bring in more food. But right now, the food is on the decline, so uh, the queen should theoretically have less population but it'd be great if, if there would be some winter bees on the grow. Mm. Ideally, that's what we're seeing. So we start with the queen. Um, uh, in addition, we are going to do a honey assessment. Um, honey is used for food for the hive over the, the period of, of dearth, of no, no food. So knowing that we're at late October and that there's gonna be virtually no blooming, November, December, January, February, and probably part of March, that's five months mm -hmm. that the bees have to be self-sufficient. Do they have enough honey? We're going to assess that in each of the hives. If we don't have enough honey, and what is enough honey? Probably one frame of honey for every frame of bees that we see. If we don't have that, uh, we do have some sugar syrup, which we can enhance uh, to get them uh, to um, take in as much uh, food that they can store as possible given that there's less on the plants. So we're prepared for that. So this is all the feeder stuff. 
So this is an internal feeder called a frame feeder. This is pre-mixed sugar syrup in the spring, the summer, most of the year we're using a one cup of sugar to one cup of water solution because that's pretty close to plant nectar. The bees can build a wax, they can store it, they can use that as immediate energy, but now that it's close to the end of the season, we drift over to three to two or two to one. We want thicker syrup because it's less likely to freeze. Uh, there's more sugar to store and it's actually, um, uh, it's about a 10, 15 year old experiment of, of using a thicker syrup uh, for the off season. We're go we can enhance it with a whole bunch of different products. Uh, this particular product um, is something called plant polyphenols. So they've extracted uh, the goodness of the plant and concentrated it and it's something that can be added to sugar syrup mm. to uh, get the bees to drink up a bit more and get a little bit of uh, vitamin goodness in there. Um, but there's also citric acid in there. And, uh, it's chemical. There's like five, maybe ten different products that enhance sugar syrup. So that's the feed portion of this type of um, inspection. Uh, back to our list. We're lo looking for queen, the queen or evidence that she's laying. We're looking for adequate food stores. We are going to be uh, now, we should have done this already in the last couple months, but we're going to check for Varroa mite. We're going to spend a lot of time um, in this class talking about Varroa mites, which are a parasite that live on the body of the bee. And it gets really bad when those parasites get into the larva and they're completely undefended. Mm -hmm. So, if your bees are born with these parasites on them, your hive is totally disadvantaged and you could lose it within two cycles of bees, so like six weeks. So, burrow mites, bad. So we're, we're going to usually detect them, and my tester is, in the past, we have um, checked, we've, we've actually taken a sample of bees. Sorry bees, oh, you yeah. sacrificed yourself for a good cause. And we've discovered some varroa mites. Not in the hives that we're seeing today, but could you see, I don't know if the camera's going to pick this up, but can you see those little uh, dots. dots that are in there? They're actually shell-shaped. Kind of yeah, if you can grab the lid, um, yeah. the lid gotcha. right on top of there is a zoomed-up version of the Varroa mite. So that's huge, right? That's about two thousand times bigger than what we're seeing in there. <laughs> so. I don't know if it's easier underneath uh, yeah. or over top. You get more light underneath. Yeah, so there is, in this particular hive, which was one of our customers uh, done on a, a, a consult, we were surprised that we saw more than two dozen mites on a sample of 200 bees. Yeah, so it was a lot. That was a lot. And they're adult mites on adult bees. So it's actually <laughs> quite late in the, the season to do that. However, if we see any mites today, we are prepared to treat. We've got um, wafers that are covered in thyme. Mites don't like thyme, thyme all. Um, so that's good. Um, mites also don't like formic acid. So we're prepared with a couple of pads that emit formic acid. And these are just two of the five different treatments that, that we have. Uh, we're, we just have the ones that are easiest today. Um, so. I'm not sure if we'll do a full mite check. We might, um, but we should be aware that varroa mites exist in your beehives. It's a modern day problem. So this, this parasite has jumped from uh, kind of the Asian variety of honeybee over to the European uh, honeybee, which is what most of us have in North America. And the European honeybee has no natural defense. So this is why the beekeeper is kind of essential. So. Mites and checking mites is extremely important in the second part of the year. When there are so many disadvantages against the bees right now, wasps, mites, loss of um, food, uh, loss of population, um, bears, right? Bears are, are hungriest in the fall. Um, so there's all kinds of things going against the honeybee. Um, but that's why we're here. So the beekeeper gets to help out 
by being aware of these dangers and trying to boost their hive in preparation for winter when the bees have no food. Are so. mites common in like all urban areas or is there a difference between urban areas and rural areas for bees and mites? Yeah, good question. So um, the mites, because bees are communal in a way, yeah. right? The range of each hive is three to five kilometers. Surely in the city, there are other beehives within that range. Mm -hmm. So the bees were intermingled. Mm -hmm. So if one of them have mites, the likeliness of the mite spreading is high. Mm -hmm. Does that happen rurally? So it happens less often rurally, mm -hmm. but if one of your hives has mites, it can spread very quickly in an apiary that's on a rural property. Because yeah. usually rural, you have uh, multiple hives mm -hmm. because you can and it's uh, totally legal and almost encouraged mm -hmm. so um, Yes, the mite exists in both situations and suburban right, which is um, in the middle and It's I guess the lesson here is that we as beekeepers must be on top of our mite situation yeah. so um, That's a tricky part of the business. That's probably um, if there were three disincentives to having a beehive. Varroa mites, stinging, and maybe all the overall cost expectation type mm -hmm. of thing is probably the three disincentives to get into bees. Mm -hmm. um, but hopefully there's enough benefits to overwhelm those, mm -hmm. those, those risks. Right. Like honey and like just being around the bees and like the chances of expanding, uh, the improvements in your garden, um, the fact that you're helping our, uh, the bees on a worldwide basis, all that is the reasons to get into beekeeping. Mm -hmm. So what else? Um, we're gonna get suited up. Um, do we want to spend any time talking about stings? You're not concerned too much, right? No. So we can, um, if there's a sting event, all we're going to do is uh, announce, hey, I, I've got I've got a bee under my suit, or I've got a sting right now, so and we'll just slowly put down the stuff we have in our hands, and we'll back away from the hive. Okay. We'll keep it very simple, and then we'll, we'll we'll just get get out of the hive, and um, and whoever's still with the hive will just close it up, and we'll uh, return to safety. Okay. We are when we behave, um, the, our behavior in the hive dictates our whole experience. Mm -hmm. So we will tend to move fairly slowly but confidently if that if that makes sense so when we're you know taking apart the frames which will be sticky uh, we're going to use our our hive tool as deliberately as possible <coughs> and not do too many sudden movements um, we will do whatever we can to keep ourselves calm and miraculously it usually keeps the bees calm so um, there's no magic to that. I'll show you a few things about the equipment and how I like to um, reverse stack things that we're finished looking at. Okay. And uh, we'll just get into a hive practice that I think works for me and is has been honed over, whatever, 10 years, mm -hmm. 60 hives, and that sort of thing. Cool. Okay. All right. Now we're going to light the smoker. Yeah, should we get the okay. smoker going? Yeah. So we started out um, the video wanting to light the smoker. So the smoker will actually keep the bees calm, should theoretically keep us calm. And what we're doing is actually tricking the bees. We are going to shoot smoke into and around the hive to make the bees believe that their hive is on fire. And in doing so, they're going to they're going to uh, smell the smoke, think their hive is on fire, and then they're going to go into their hive and just suck back honey, not paying attention to us. That's the theory. So they also tend to communicate with smell. This will distract them from that. So if one of us gets stung, that usually will release a alarm pheromone, which draws the attention of more bees. Mm -hmm. So one kind of leads to five. Sometimes, potentially. Um, the smoke prevents some of that. It's one of the inventions that 
allows the beehive uh, beekeeper to interact with the beehive pretty successfully, pretty calmly, and short of us uh, smoking a pipe, the smoker is a great invention for that. Is there any trick to getting this thing going well so that it doesn't just go out? Yeah, so the material that you use in your smoker uh, should be dry, flammable, but not burned hot. So there's lots of people out there that use uh, newspaper or whatever paper that, or magazine uh, stuff that uh, cardboard that burns very hot and very quickly. Um, I like to use something that burns a little bit slower. Um, so burlap is ideal. This compressed wood, these pellets are ideal as well. <clears throat> Conveniently labeled smoker fuel. Um, but there's there's bark mulch. There is uh, wood chips. There are pine cones. You can uh, peat moss. You can use almost anything that is flammable, burnable. And what we're after is not a super, super hot fire. I mean, at first it's okay if it gets uh, orangey, but what we ultimately want is something that will burn down to a puffy white smoke. So it's not actually like on fire when you're using it, right? It's just, right. It's just embering. Yeah. yeah. So at the beginning, it's okay if this stuff is on fire because you need something to burn. You got to get it going. Yeah. And, and this is this is one of the worst parts of having a, a bee inspection is having your smoker go out. There's there's nothing like being surrounded by by bees and then your smoker goes out. That can be unnerving. So, so once you see uh, a bit of an orange flame actually going, like every good Boy Scout, then you close the lid. You can see the fire in there, right? Uh. Oh yeah, I can. The camera can, but I can. Right. The folks at home are saying, "Hey, throw on more fuel." So, you see, you see the the orange flame, right? That's that. That's actually too hot. You're not trying to burn the bees. You're just trying to smoke them. So this is closer to what you're you're aiming for, but I know that the fire isn't quite Still going, going yet. There. Yeah. So with your hand, you can test it. This is actually a relatively cool smoke. Mm. Right, and that's ideal. So, but of course, I only put enough fuel in there to last um, for, for three puffs. Yeah. And we might not even get in the hive with that. So, I'm gonna give it a little bit more. I'm gonna throw in some pellets there. This is what's nice about, um, there are lots of people out there that um, have a team of beekeepers. Sometimes it's, um, you know, uh, partners in ownership. Sometimes it's, um, uh, you know, master apprentice type situation. Sometimes it's um, parent and child. So it's nice to have an extra set of hands in the aviary for sure. So each of the people in the beehive should have a tool like a smoker with extra fuel. Um, we've got a number of different hive tools here. So we've showed, showed these before. Forgive me for how dirty these look, but if your suit and tools are bright and clean, they won't be for very long. Uh, there's lots of sticky, messy stuff in the hive um, that will get your uh, all of your equipment and your clothes um, for beekeeping purposes only. So that's why my suit, it gets washed alone once <laughs> a season. So, um, any hive tool uh, calling out to you? So, the standard hive tool, it's almost like your uh, typical paint scraper. It's got um, a hooked end which is very handy to lift out frames. It's also got a sharp end to scrape off any wax or propolis that are in the hive. Uh, one of the newer uh, innovations in hive tool technology is the J-hook that can lift up uh, frames that are really sticky. It's got two sharp ed edges as well. This one here is a classic. This was, this was made by um, uh, a blacksmith who was also a beekeeper and this was built for a top bar hive. So uh, we might be using that today, a classic. Um, and there are, there are a couple of uh, other innovations. It's basically, they're hybrids between uh, the, the standard hive tool and the J hooks. So to each their own, we have one of everything. Another tool you might need is a bee brush. So bee brushes um, are particularly used well in um, honey harvest time, getting the bees off the frames. Um, a little easier, a little gentler than, you know, banging the frames or 
uh, forcing them off with the back of your hand. It's just as easy uh, and gentler to use a bee brush, which is uh, nylon or, or simulated horsehair or a feather. Right? You could have a feather, but who has a feather in their, their you know, bee equipment? Another item that I like to carry around is a perch. So this will hang on the side of the, uh, the beehive and allow me to hold uh, a frame or two or three um, to the side, give me lots of room in the beehive. Uh, there are, I, I could talk about tools all day, but um, let's not. Let's get the smoker going and let's get in the hive. <laughs> 